So, the theme for this evening is uh, on the edge. I'm going to talk about technology. Actually, I'm going to talk about observation. Observation is an activity that we all can relate to. Uh, we observe every day, we observe each other, things around us. You can observe me now, I can observe you. And in a technical uh, or more research um, context, observation can mean to collect and record data. And remote sensing, which is the, the topic that we are working with, is actually just to observe an object from a distance. Distance is good. Uh, sometimes a bird's eye view can give you a new perspective, much more information than you would get by standing next to an object observing it. So I will give you a few examples on that. This one, crops in a field, yes. Uh, we can make it a little bit more interesting, seen from above. Uh, another one, house on the beach, yes, it's a house on the beach, but not just any beach. This is the palm in uh, Dubai. Uh, a couple of more. Boats uh, in a desert? Uh, yes. Uh, actually, this used to be one of the largest uh, inland basins of water in the world. Uh, it's been uh, evaporating for the last 50 years, uh, causing a uh, salty desert. Uh, this is the Aral Sea. Uh, Earth? This is why we call it the blue marble. This is actually the, the, the best and most detailed image we have of the Earth as today. This is made by NASA, and it's uh, put together in detail, by, uh, stitched together by uh, numerous observations from uh, satellites, uh, actually down to each square kilometers uh, on the planet. So, at KSAT, here in Tromsø, we are used to seeing the world from above. We have been doing so for 40 years from the satellite station here. Uh, probably not so many of you know that Tromsø is the space capital of Norway. In the city of Tromsø and the uh, county of Tromsø, we have uh, several uh, leading companies within satellite remote sensing. And this was formalized in the establishment of uh, the Center for Remote Technology here in Tromsø in 2008. That consists of the University, the Polar Institute, NORUT, Kongsberg Space Tech, and Kongsberg Satellite Services. So, take a step back. We're not the first one trying to observe the Earth from above. It's been numerous attempts, more or less successful, uh, during uh, history. These are specially trained pigeons uh, from the 1800s in Europe, equipped with uh, customized cameras to take images from above. This is actually one of those pictures taken of a chateau outside Frankfurt. And you can actually see the wings uh, flapping on the side. So uh, it's quite cool. So it just uh, gives an example of how we humans, uh, we, we have been taking advantage of new technology to try and observe uh, the world around us. These are the modern birds. Uh, these birds fly around 300 to 800 kilometers above us with a ground speed of seven kilometers per second, which is really, really fast. They spend around 100 minutes to go around the world once, and they do this 14 times a day. So, a lot of different ones, but what is, uh, they have in common is that they all have to pass over the poles every time, uh, over the North Pole and over the South Pole. And this is when we can speak to them from our station at Svalsat in Svalbard and here in Tromsø, from uh, Troll in Antarctica, and now also from uh, Dubai, Singapore and South Africa. We support over 60 satellite missions, uh, doing 11,000 passes a month, uh, but from this network we can also access data from all over the world. So you can say maybe, I mean, building antennas and installations in the most remote, coldest parts of the world. I mean, Svalbard is nearly North Pole, but Troll is really middle of nowhere. It's cold and very remote. But again, it has to do with the same as in real estate. It has to do all about location, location and location. So we are here, we are in the North. Uh, Norway, we have uh, a lot of challenges. 
First of all, we have huge ocean areas to monitor, uh, up to six times the size of the mainland, and we have very few people to do it. Uh, in addition, I can just mention some of these uh, points. I mean, we have increased oil uh, and gas activity, transport, ecotourism, a lot of weather, and, um, and in addition, um, just we have this. These are new possible shipping lanes uh, to Asia, going over the polar uh, regions towards uh, Asia with the northeast or the northwest passage. Well, it takes shorter time than to go around, and it uh, consumes less fuel, it's more cost effective. Uh, so, of course, the shipping industry sees this as a great opportunity, and also less pirates. But an open passage up here does not mean it's ice-free, and with ice comes also risk. So this is a series of images taken over Greenland, just to show you a little bit of how powerful the ice can be. Uh, this ice flow moves 35 meters per day, it breaks off icebergs uh, the size of nine square kilometers. So it means ice moves and the conditions, they change, and they change fast. So, as I said, open, but not ice-free. And you're far from search and rescue, you're far from oil spill response. Where are the rescue ships to pick you up when you're in the icy water? Of course, it's not all bad. I mean, this also uh, initiates great opportunities for trade and commerce along the coast. Uh, but there is a need for enhanced monitoring in the north. So, what can be our contribution? To this. Fresh satellite images providing uh, a safer and better navigation. We can find positions and identification of ships. Uh, we can detect oil spills and forecast the drift and track icebergs. So Norway has been an early bird when it comes to taking advantage of advanced satellite technology to monitor these areas for uh, uh, ship traffic, uh, security, a tool for fishing enforcement, and for regulation of oil explore, exploration and production. Uh, and also, we have a lot of activities <clears throat> by the water, by the sea, in the sea, uh, that's going on at the same time, in parallel. We get our food from this sea, the recreation, uh, and also um, it's the means for transport and uh, oil and gas activity. And all this should happen in a sustainable way. Now, this is not unique for Norway. Uh, these challenges are faced all over the world. All coastal nations uh, face these challenges. And it's in this that Tromsø and Norway can contribute. So, this is uh, a radar image from space. Uh, it has a lot of black dots, uh, and it's a bit grey and boring. But what you're actually looking at here is the biggest oil spill outside England in 13 years. Uh, it was um, analysed here and reported from here, in Tromsø, to the British Coast Guard. So, detecting oil and illegal dumping is something we do every day here in Tromsø, uh, to Europe and uh, globally. And this service was developed in Norway. Now, something that not everyone knows is that it's not always the biggest accidents that can har be most harmful. Even the smaller spills at the worst time and the worst place can be really bad. And the illegal dumping that happens every day, the spillage in the waterways, can create like a, how do you say, a chronic pollution in the waterways that is really harmful for birds and marine uh, life. So what we can do to help is to alert uh, the, the government in 30 minutes from the image is taken, and we can also say something about the identity of who did the dumping. So, as I said, we operate on a global basis. We can get access to data from all over the world, from here, from the north. Uh, and satellites can contribute in many areas uh, when we monitor the environment. For instance, in Brazil, 
monitoring uh, deforestation of uh, tropical rainforest, and it helps. Actually, the Brazilian Environmental Agency, uh, they said that the reason for the decline actually of the deforestation the last years is due to use of satellite imagery. Uh, also with radar, so you can see what happens underneath the clouds, so you cannot hide. So this is good. And also, uh, we can access data very quickly. When there is a disaster, uh, like here, this is a before and after image uh, of the, um, after the tsunami in Japan. We have rapid access to data after landslides and earthquakes and floods and this kind of things. And then I also wanted to mention to you that Google Earth, I mean, most of you know Google Earth. You've probably been in there looking at your house, uh, maybe your neighbor uh, and everything. And this is really good because this has revolutionized our industry, making satellite imagery very accessible to the population, to all people. But the thing is that there is a lot of sophisticated sensors in addition to imagery from satellites. For instance, some of these things, I mean, we can measure ice thickness, gravity, uh, CO2 and methane, and sea surface temperature, we can look at algae, there's a lot of things. And very important is weather. Weather data, that's um, maybe the larger part. So, um, for the future, what does the future hold? I mean, will we all be walking around with like a spy satellite, an individual spy satellite over our heads, monitoring our every move? Um, no, far from it. And I mean, we are already having trouble uh, meeting the Hollywood expectations of today. Um, trying to match what Hollywood can do today is already difficult. He just committed suicide oh, here. Or he learned to fly. Air one, stay with him. Target's on a move. Satellite imagery coming through. One meter res layering wireframe coming your way over. Okay, gentlemen, we're back online. Okay, hey, wireframe download complete. All right, we have a tracer in the stairwell on 20, traveling down. 19, 18, 17. Well, you took the point taken. <laughs> I mean, due to physical limitations, a lot of these things that you see in Hollywood movies, it's not, simply not just possible. You cannot stop a satellite in space, make it go backwards and hover over one building, maybe zoom in and shoot three people. This is not possible. I mean, even though we can do a lot of cool things with satellites, uh, there's always a trade-off. So what does the future hold? I mean, the real future, the near future. For us, it uh, has a lot to do with price and size, or the opposite, the size and price of the satellites. Um, before, um, let's say 20 years ago, a satellite could weigh 2.5 tons, and you will get a resolution of 10 meters on the ground. Today, you can have a satellite that weighs 10 kilos, and we have a 10 times better resolution. Uh, we also look at sophisticated sensors and also formation flying uh, with uh, satellites, which is quite cool. But back to size, I mean, we're talking about cube satellites, the size of a, a grapefruit, uh, or this, Mi microchip satellites. They're actually testing now three microchips on the International Space Station. Swarms of microchips. This is just something that is there, or can be a possible uh, future. So, to be re realistic, I think we will have more satellites providing better coverage and frequent updates. We have more detail, a larger range of sophisticated sensors. And when we put all this information together, we can have a more accurate picture of what is going on. The state uh, and the characterization of the climate and understanding of the Earth system. So we will be keeping an eye on you from above. Maybe not like in the movies, but with real on the edge technology. Thank you very much.